Welcome back to Project Lowball. In our last episode, we scoured through ruins, snow, swamps, and the distortion world to find the lowest levels possible for the Sinnoh League. Today, we're giving The Progenitor, the video that started it all, the sequel that it deserves. If you haven't seen the first video, definitely pause the video now and go give it a watch to get all the context you need. In the last Emerald video, I read through every single comment. And a good portion of you saw improvements that I didn't even think of, which is great. That is the point of the video and the challenge. But before we dive into all the improvements I made, and you all made as a community, there's two mechanics that I missed in the last video, and I need to explain them. I want you to meet one of the most broken, overpowered, insano, game-warping Pokemon in Hoenn. Zigzagoon. Yep, Zigzagoon. This little Tanuki does more than just grow into a speedy, sweeping machine. It picks up trash on your journey. And one trainer's trash is another trainer's treasure. This is the full chart of items you can get from pickup. And if you focus on this portion, you can see where things start to get interesting. If your pickup Pokemon are above level 80, you have a 1% chance to get a Leftovers. And above level 90, you have that same 1% chance to get TM26, Earthquake. What this means is that even before the first gym, you have access to Leftovers and Earthquake. Not to mention endless proteins, HP ups, PP ups, Ultra Balls, Rare Candies, Nuggets, everything. And yeah, I can hear the cogs in your brain turning. This mechanic changes everything. The second mechanic we need to talk about is the daycare. Now, as a lot of you pointed out, I missed the opportunity to go to the daycare before challenging Brawly, which you're all correct. You can access the daycare before taking on the second gym. What I also didn't know is that I can entirely skip level up moves via breeding. Here's how. If both parents know a move that the baby can learn via leveling up, that Pokemon will inherit that move. For example, if I breed two Swampert to learn Hydro Pump, the Mudkip will have Hydro Pump and not have to wait till level 42 to get access to it. Combine that with my newfound items via pickup, we have a lot of updates to chew through. So let's not wait any longer. The Brawly fight is obviously very straightforward. As we saw last episode, you are completely invulnerable and just walk through the team. I just want to take a moment to showcase the egg move process. You'll notice that the Sableye has moves like Shadow Ball and Nightshade before their ideal level. Like I mentioned previously, this is completely legal and part of the breeding mechanics setup. So I just wanted to add those moves there to kind of give you guys an idea of what you can unlock in a Pokemon at such a low level, which is, again, Pretty wild that I never knew this until now. And obviously, this new setup is confirmed. For real this time. And since we have a couple seconds to kill before the end of this fight, let me know in the comments below what your favorite Pokemon from the Hoenn region is. Now, on to Watson. Last episode, we used a level 14 Geodude with a strategy of spamming Rock Throw and then leveling up to learn Magnitude right as we needed it to confirm the setup. Now, this time, we'll be making full use of our recently acquired Leftovers and Earthquake TM to take on Watson at level 5. This makes three gyms in a row we use a level 5 Pokemon, and they're all quite consistent actually. For those unfamiliar with Vitamins, they apply EVs directly to a Pokemon up to 100 per stat. This lets us get exactly 100 HP and attack EVs, giving us a well-needed edge in this fight. While obviously this game plan is to just spam Earthquake, the equipped leftovers does make this level 5 start viable, and of course, without being able to get any lower, this is the new confirmed setup for Watson. While I have 30 seconds to spare, I just wanted to note how hilarious it is that even 20 years later, as a grown man, I am still learning new things about this game. It blows my mind, and it's super fun to explore it all and lap it all out and show it with everyone. And if you want to be a part of the projects as well, make sure to join the Discord down below, drop some ideas and some theory crafting, as I will be taking a short break and then eventually working on Heart Gold or Soul Silver. And that's a huge project. It's at least 22 fights. 
so feel free to join using the link below and get involved in the project. I'll also be hosting some weekly events as well in the near future, and I'm excited to see you all there. Now, let's wrap up this level 5 Geodude fight. It's already embarrassing enough for Watson. Flannery. We meet again. Last episode, I struggled with the terrible RNG of Rock Throw, Confusion, Soul Rock, and then that nagging itch of an Azumarill that just had a few too many levels. Now, with these new mechanics, we can blow this fight out of the water. Literally. We're taking our previous example, Hydro Pump Mudkip, and evolving it to March Dawn. Pre-damaging it to put into Torn's range to get that 50% boost on top of our insanely strong Hydro Pump will make easy work of Flannery's team. Even with all this raw power, at level 16, we don't get enough XP for Torkoal to always faint to the Hydro Pump. Hence, the King's Rock is equipped to prevent us from getting absolutely murked by a Body Slam. But the roll is heavily in our favor. Now, with level 16 clearly being the evolution cusp, this is the newest confirmed setup. Hi again, Dad. Last time, we used Bulk Up Matchop to set up on the very dancy Spindle Lead. But, with our, again, new mechanics knowledge, we can use one of Norman's own Pokemon against him. Thanks to some serious testing and theory crafting from Seriously Seely, who wrote me a novel of ideas in my comment section, shoutouts to him, this Lunoon set is actually able to deal with Norman just as well as the Matchop, with a few less turns, and being a few levels lower. Our only RNG check is one key flinch on slacking, and Citrus Berry heals him out of the healing range of the Norman. Everything else is just a clean KO. Lunoon obviously can't be any lower of a level, so this is our new confirmed strategy. Also, if you're curious, I will add, I did some math on the side. The RNG for both setups is about the same, but obviously this Lunoon set is still superior. We move on to the flying type leader, Winona. And in the last video, I proudly proclaimed that my level 26 Manetric was the best setup I could find for Winona. It's super confirmed. And a few of you pointed out that I glossed over a certain yellow mascot. For all of you Pikachu believers, I did you a solid. Welcome to a level 16 solo clear against Winona. Now, for some extra details, when you catch a Pikachu in Pokemon Emerald, it has a 5% chance to hold a light ball, which doubles Pikachu special attack. Now, that wasn't actually enough to match Manetric's power levels, but the difference came in the move Double Team. Swablu's AI is weird, to say the least, and it mostly just spams Mirror Move the whole time, so you do have a good chance of setting up to six Double Teams, maxing your evasion, and therefore maxing your chances to survive Altaria, which is the true threat of the whole fight. Even being below level 20, your Thunderbolt still has enough damage to deal with Pelipper, Skarmory, and you have just enough damage to get through Tropius as well. We have to stop at level 16 though, because any lower, and Swablu starts to see Aerial Ace as a favorable move, other Mons start to see Aerial Ace as a favorable move, which will just one-shot you right through Double Team Miss. So that's the trade-off, but hey, I'm not complaining about shaving 10 levels off my last fight. So, as you'll see, we max out our evasion, run through Swablu, dodge Altaria's Earthquakes, and then waltz through the rest of Winona's team, leading to, and I promise you this time, a confirmed setup. Thank you again to the people who reminded me of Pikachu's existence. With Tate and Liza seeing no new leads, and Juan of course being clowned on by a freshly evolved Shedinja, we're now gonna move on to the Elite Four for some well-deserved improvements. We start with Glacia, which was inspired by Mankey Might in his video, showing that Lanoon can easily handle the Elite Four with the help of items, which actually gave me an idea. If Glacia's lead Celio never sees a kill, it will always use Hail, which I'm sure you're all familiar with by now. This is five turns of 6.6% damage, or about a third of your HP, rounded down. Combine that with two points of pre-fight damage, then I belly drum to take half of my health, 
and then one use of substitute for a quarter of my health, do a little quick math, and we are left with exactly one point of HP, giving us a maxed out attack, max power flail to just crush Glacia, but seven levels less than my original idea of Blaziken. With this EV spread and level, this is the lowest level we can be while still outspeeding Glacia's Glalies, leaving me with a confirmed. Fun fact, thanks to Silk Scarf, the badge boost, even though we're at 10 health versus the original one, it's a guaranteed kill, just barely. So as long as you get those simple two points of pre-fight damage, this is a guaranteed setup every time. And now we move on to Drake. And while of course, my Dusclops put up a strong showing and was a really cool set and you all loved it, Seelie had a better idea. You remember in the last episode, we abused the Shelgon AI to set up a couple extra turns. You saw the same in the Phoebe fight as well, just getting free turns to set up. Seelie took this idea to the next level using Vigoroth, paired with setup as well as Encore. Vigoroth is a mostly overlooked Pokemon, but having a good mix of setup, utility, and those passable base stats, it's actually a really good solution for this fight. While the idea is simple, the execution isn't. Seely originally pitched this set to me at level 35. I managed to shave four levels off, but it's cutting it really close. Let me walk you through the sequence. Of course, once Shelgon uses Protect, we start encoring it. It locks in and we slowly set up. Here's the problem. Shelgon only has 10 protects. We need 11 setup turns, so it's a bit of a balance. Your goal at the end of the Shelgon rotation is for you to be at nearly, if not full health. The reason why is because you'll need to now re-encore lock the Altaria as well for you to get through the rest of this fight safely. The thing is, Shelgon will rock tomb you, that's fine, Vigoroth just isn't able to face tank the stab dragon claws coming from Salamence and Kingdra. You're going to need to get an extra amnesia turn off, and that will only be possible against Altaria. So you not only need to get lucky with the encores and have the protext alternate at the right times, you will need to then lock an Altaria on it as well. I would say overall, you're looking at about a 5% success rate. As well, you can get the setup online in the usual four or five tries. You do have to dodge a lot of crits in the meantime. Now, let's say you've successfully fully set up and you're facing down Altaria. It's a simple clean two hit KO with return and you'll need to now finish the sweep. Even with max defense boosts and max special defense boosts, I miserably failed this at level 30, which is one level off which just goes to show how delicate this setup can be and also the sheer power that Drake's team has. Anyways, once you see Salamence, you're basically in the money. You again have to two or three hit KO it and you can easily waltz in onto the champion. Of course, the champion's fully solved, but I wanna thank Celia again for leaving such a detailed comment and giving me this set idea, which with my tweaking, shaved another six levels off of Drake. Because I couldn't do this at level 30, I am going to give this setup a confirmed. Yes, we're back at Meteor Falls. I too thought my Registeel strategy was impenetrable, but Seely took me back down to earth with this Smeargle set. And honestly, it's too cool to pass up. This is a multi-turn fear setup. For those who don't know what fear stands for, that's Focus Sash, Endeavor, Quick Attack, Rattata, which is now a commonly used colloquial acronym for cheesy low-level mon that uses Endeavor and some sort of priority move to kill you. Fear as a strategy completely fails to a lot of things, especially heals. So to get around this, what Seely did was added Wrap. Now, if we set up Wrap in advance and then Endeavor, the trainers can't heal the Pokemon in time for them to get out of this strategy. So there you go, that's how this works. So it doesn't look too RNG heavy, but I would say this is also a 5% or less success rate. And here's why. We use the Starf Berry to boost speed, which is actually a 20% chance as it will boost a random stat by two. To confirm each KO, we need Spore to keep the opposing Mon asleep for at least three turns, 
and Rap cannot afford to miss if it's only a three turn sleep. Rap being 80% accuracy, it's already looking a bit dicey. And then we move on to Metagross, who holds a Citrus Berry. This is a lot less scary than it looks, you simply have to run the line twice to confirm the KO and finish off Steven. Not too shabby actually. Also a friendly reminder, we can circumvent the sketch level up requirements via the move relearner and a heart scale, hence we have the four moves before the standard level 31. But hold on one second, I think I'm getting a call. Yo champion, it's Brawly. I've gotten a lot stronger since our last fight here, and I'm itching for a rematch. And I'm not gonna lose to just a Sableye, so don't even try it. Brawly, out. Hey son, it's been a while. No time for your old man now that you're the champion? Why don't you stop by the gym so we can have a proper rematch? Also, call your mom. She won't stop bothering me about some new running shoes that you got, and she's wondering if they still fit you or not. Anyways, I'm sorry this is short. I gotta go. Wally keeps asking me how to catch a Pokemon again, and uh, I don't know. Alright, I'll see you later. Let's do a bit of statistics. Out of everyone watching this video, I can confidently say that 90% of you have completed Pokemon Emerald and entered the Hall of Fame, at least once in your life. Now, out of that 90%, how many of you knew there were rematches for the gym leaders? Of course, a lot less of you. Now, out of that percentage, let's say 40, how many of you knew there were four rematches per leader? Or even better, how to even unlock these rematches? We're now talking a fraction of a fraction of the player base. And then there's me, because I unlocked them all. And I spent more time grinding for those unlocks than I did recording and editing combined. Here's why. To unlock the rematches, you need to have already entered the Hall of Fame. We now have to complete 20 trainer battles or encounter 60 wild Pokemon. Because I wanted a straightforward process that I can repeat mindlessly while watching YouTube videos, I just mashed A against the Elite Four. So quick math will tell you, complete the five trainer gauntlet four times in a row, and bam, that's a rematch unlocked. That's easy. But here's the catch. For some reason, the code only gives you a 31% chance to unlock the rematch. So now we have to at least triple the input. So now let's put all the math together to show what kind of commitment you're getting into to unlock them all. Let's assume 80 trainer battles per rematch, just to be on the safe side. Now multiply that by four per gym leader and multiply that eight for every gym leader. That's 2,560 trainer battles, assuming average luck. The actual time spent will vary by strategy, but to put this into perspective, getting the last tier of rematches by spamming Elite Four took me over 16 hours. And yes, my emulator was on fast forward, two and a half times fast forward. Now, if I can't guilt you into liking and subscribing after all of that spiel, then maybe some of these six strats that you're about to see will convince you. Of course, rematches bring us right back to Roxanne, and we bring a rain team to counter those pesky rock types. Melodic has a simple job as the bringer of rain, and using her Marvel scale ability, we have enough defense to be mostly ignored by Roxanne's offense-heavy team. On the other side, we have Ludicolo, who does not have the same defensive prowess and therefore needs some more levels, but we use its grass water typing and the swift swim boost to outspeed and just blow up Roxanne's team. Getting past Golem is easy. Melodic is a little bit faster than Ludicolo and can set up rain, so Ludicolo can get a fully boosted waterfall right to Golem, which now brings out Amistar. Amistar doesn't see any KOs, and will simply sit there and spam protect, like this is a VGC match or something. But we don't get the range on Aerodactyl here, and so we have to pivot our focus onto Amistar while Roxanne heals up. In Amistar's place, Kabutops comes in, and while scary, it does not see a KO either, so it starts set up with Swords Dance, naturally. Unfortunately, what Roxanne doesn't see is Ludicolo has Hidden Power Grass and a Miracle Seed to just obliterate the Kabutops and confirm the KO. The rest of this fight is straightforward. 
you're going to be spamming water moves and keeping rain up to secure a very easy win, but on Roxanne's strongest team, with half the levels of course. As we all know, Rock is a really weak type defensively. There actually might be a slightly better setup, but I couldn't find it or make it work. So for now, a confident grade will suffice. We now have our rematch with Brawly, who was right to say that he won't lose to just to save a lie. Good thing we brought a Dinjas too. Being champion gives us some really cool perks, like the Battle Frontier, exclusive tutors, all the fame, fortune, girls. Anyways, this gives us access to new moves like Psych Up, which takes advantage of Ninja's setup capabilities by copying the stat changes of any Pokemon. Now keep that in mind, you'll be seeing a lot of Psych Up in the next couple fights. Even though we're level 23 and weak to a lot of typings, Hitmonchan actually doesn't see a KO on Ninjask, thanks to the max special defense investments. So instead it goes for Protect. We fake out Hitmonchan, and then begin the setup. So all of Hitmonlee's moves explode Ninjask, so we have to rely on Bright Powder and bad base accuracies to give us a roughly 35% chance to safely set up. After that, we of course psych up the massive attack and speed boost with Sableye, who is at level 22 for just enough base attack and just barely outspeed Hitmonchan after a few level ups. Now, somehow knowing it's in danger all of a sudden, Hitmonchan will soon enough go on the offense, so we have to protect up and take out the Metacham, which lets us live another turn and then finalize and close out this fight. We now have enough levels to completely sweep the rest of Brawly's team. This is a pretty straightforward route, and with no levels to save, I'm happy to give this fight a confirmed. But keep in mind that the AI is a bit of a wild west once you get past the first 10 turns or so. So be wary when you're testing. Turns out that you can't teach an old gym leader new tricks as Watson still has zero coverage on his team, even after all these fights. Now, the setup we have here is extremely slim, but there's a bit more RNG to this fight than you'd expect. Smeargle is basically a coughing baby versus two hydrogen bombs in this battle. Because of that, the AI will pick a move at random, so you will need to reset a few times to see Thunder Punch from Electabuzz, and ideally Thunder from Raichu. Now, even with the Bright Powder accuracy debuff, this is still theoretically a 3% success rate to get the double miss that you will need. But after that, it's completely smooth sailing from there. After the Sword Stance boost and the Swagger boost, Watson can't do much but spam protect and watches his team gets annihilated by yet another low level ground type. Like, it's just sad, man. Just like, like hidden power ice or something at least. Like, come on. Easy confirmed. Easy. Before we get started, I want to say that this fight was really tough to lab. I know it's just a bunch of fire types, but a lot of the simpler rain setups you can think of either required too many levels or just completely fell apart against the overheat spam. It was pretty ridiculous, honestly. So after some retooling and some calcs, my testing brought me to using Psych Up Relicanth. That's right. Relicanth. When's the last time you've seen that Pokemon mentioned in a YouTube video? Now, Relicanth has some decent base stats, but its water rock typing makes it actually really resilient to the rock slide and overheat spam that we see in this fight. Now, let's combine that with Tentacruel. Tentacruel is there to set up rain, set up barrier, and sword stance. Now, with some careful ordering, we can actually turn Relicanth into not only an immovable object, but also an unstoppable force. This is how we do it. After copying enough boosts and the rain dance being set up, Relicanth will outspeed all of Flannery's team, thanks to the swift swim and having just enough levels. Because of the amnesia boosts and then also psyching up the barriers and sword stances, you actually shrug off any potential attacks while just absolutely cleaning house with Earthquake. If you set up everything correctly, you should have no problem breezing through Flannery's team, but 
there is a chance that you can get flinched too much, miss a turn, and then sun gets set back up. So make sure you get max turns of rain, and that should give you enough time to get through their team, bar any crazy protect lock. Once you get to Torkoal, don't stress, Torkoal is still a lot slower than you, even without the rain boost. So you simply have to earthquake twice like you see me do here, and the fight is over. Now, I'm only going to give this a confidence, because there's probably a better setup out there. I just can't find it. So if any of you detectives want to get on that case, let me know in the Discord. We move on to the dad rematch. Now, this fight is really scary on paper, with Blissey skill swapping Truant off of Slacking to turn it into an absolute monster. We can use the doubles move staple fake out to work around this. Here's how. First off, this fight is actually really similar to Watson, where you might need to reset a few times to get the right move order. Slacking needs to use either Fire Blast or Blizzard and miss Smeargle for the setup to come online. What we do here is we fake out Blissey, not Slacking, to delay the skill swap and begin our setup. Metacham is one of the very few fighting types who happens to even learn Psych Up, and we can take advantage of Smeargle's endless move options to copy Agility for the speed boost, and Belly Drum for the attack boost, and demolish Dad's team. Because that Blissey just skill swapped Truant from Slacking, it's not going to move every second turn. You can safely ignore Blissey and focus down the other side of the team without even thinking about it. While Smeargle clearly won't do a lot of damage, it's really worth to keep alive as it will bait Blissey Focus Punch, Kangaskhan Fake Out, and the more focus the better, because that prevents Blissey from using Sing on your Medicham, which will likely kill the attempt. Now, with all that being said, looking back on the footage here, I do see some potential of shaving off maybe a level or three off of this Smeargle, so a confident grade will suffice for now. But I do want to add that the nature of Smeargle setups, this could possibly be done with another Pokemon, I just went for the strongest fighting type, as it did make this not only quite easy, but Slacking is an insanely beefy Pokemon. So good luck with your attempts, but unfortunately Metacham's evolution is gating it at level 37 for now. We're now on to the sixth rematch, Winona, who, believe it or not, was the absolute hardest, longest, most tiring fight to prepare for all because of that stupid banana bird tree thing that is Tropius. Let's focus on our team. Zatu and Hypno are more than just convenient stat blocks. They both have abilities that reduce or nullify sleep entirely, which disincentivizes the AI from ever using Hypnosis, and in turn, gives us so much more breathing room to set up fully and completely ignore Noctowl. Because it only has Dream Eater and Psychic, we can safely shrug off any of the incoming damage, because of course, we naturally resist it. We have Hypno, whose job is to set up Calm Minds and Barriers for Zatu to copy over, and the Double Paralysis from Zatu gives us much more time to use Leftovers Healing in replace of True Healing, and stay healthy and deal with the Aerial Aces and Earthquakes coming from Tropius. Zatu is going to get focused a lot, I can't explain why, but in all my testing, eventually Hypno just gets ignored and Zatu gets double focused. So don't be afraid to use rest and take those couple of extra turns to stay healthy. You're going to be spending 80% of your time and facing down just Tropius and Noctowl and setting up. Once you're at max stats, you're ready to go, and you will only double target the left side until there's absolutely nothing left to focus but the Noctowl. Now, don't worry about predicting the switch in either, as the AI cheats and will send in the best mod to deal with your attacks. What I mean by that is, if you click Thunder Punch and Thunder Punch, it will send in Dragonite. You might think, oh, let me just save state really quick and use Ice Punch. No, in that case, it'll send in Skarmory to eat the Ice Punch instead. So, just, just turn your brain off and click moves until the fight is over. 
Now, this took me a couple tries to get there, and this setup can theoretically work at level 27 or 26, but the longer you risk the crits and the less base stats you have, it's very, very hard to deal with, plain and simple. Zatu is very weak without some defense investments, and the more speed it needs to paralyze the Tropius, the worse. You could, in theory, do a slow paralyze, but regardless, you kind of run into the same problem of having low base stats, the lower and lower you shave the levels. But I do encourage you to try. For now, this fight is a confident. Now we're on to the double battle experts, Tate and Liza. We're actually running this back with the Brawly squad, just with a few move changes and some extra levels. This time, there's a bit more RNG in the table, and you will need to safely get Ninjas to a solid evasion stat. I personally use double team three times in this example here, but it would work with two or four, whatever you're comfortable with. Chestoberry is equipped on the Sableye, so you can psych up the evasion boosts as soon as possible and keep Sableye from being dead in the water and perma slept for too long. The ideal outcome, if you were to do this fight, is to get Ninjas to max attack, max evasion, and live. Now, being a dark type against very little coverage and max evasion, Sableye can very comfortably solo once you get past the Claydol, but having Ninjask around just makes the fight much more consistent, much easier, and of course, much faster. Once you're finished setting up, you're gonna to wanna to double target the Claydol and watch as Hypno alternates just between Protect, Hypnosis, Hypnosis Miss, Protect, Hypnosis Miss, over and over for the entire fight, and you'll just cruise through Tate and Liza's team. Now the levels you see on screen are very deliberate. Level 25 is the earliest that Ninjas can get Swords Dance, Ninkata can't get it so you can't do any funny breeding tricks, you're hard locked to level 25, and with max defense, max HP, Level 30 is the lowest level Sableye can be and still live Claydol Earthquake, which as you've probably ascertained, the AI will go for a move if it sees the kill. So not seeing the kill, your Sableye can safely set up throughout this whole fight. I am almost like 100% certain that this is a confirmed, but I have this tiny nagging itch at the back of my brain that someone can cheese this a little bit better. So again, I encourage you if you can, Show your work in the Discord. And now, the final fight. Juan. Who got the memo, apparently? Juan brought coverage for Shudinja. No, not an actual damaging move. Just Parish Song and like a confusion move. So, definitely not something I can work around or avoid. But, ignoring the sarcasm, this is a very long fight but I would say as straightforward as you could hope. Your goal is to toy with Lapras while setting up your Shedinja. And this will take a reset or two to get used to the Parish Song timing, but I'll give you a hint. So turn one with Mr. Mime, you're always, always going to skill swap Water Absorb onto yourself to stay alive and healthy, to always be there to taunt the Lapras. AI seems to love going for Parish Song if it failed any interaction. For example, Hydro Pump into Water Absorb. So this is how I predict the Parish Song, and I taunt accordingly. Now you're gonna have to set up with Mr. Mime alongside the Shredinja, while being very on top of the taunts. Make sure to read the text box, because taunt will end randomly between two and five turns in Generation 3. Once you've set up both the Shredinja and the Mr. Mime, you're gonna start focusing the Lapras side. The Whiskash is completely harmless. Eventually, Walbrain will come in, see a kill, and just body slam your Mr. Mime to oblivion. But that's fine, you've gotten past the hard part. This Sudinja is equipped with Faint Attack and Aerial Lace to be fully equipped to deal with the double team spammers. So I cut all of the long nonsense out for your sanity, and you basically have to sit through 10 rests from Kingdra alongside double teams and missing moves. The entire fight is about 20 minutes. 10 or less if you have fast forward on. So be prepared, but hence we bring those moves. Now, technically, Mr. Mime could be about one level lower, 
but in my testing he just gets smacked around a bit too hard at the lower levels. Overall, I believe I have not only the right setup, but the right execution, so I'm calling this a confirmed regardless. Now, you might have heard me a few times say, when you test this, and you might be thinking, like, dude, Mr. YouTuber, Mr. Content Creator, I am not sitting through 20 plus hours of grinding to test these fights. So, knowing that, if you head on down to my Discord server, I will have the save file publicly available that has all the final rematches unlocked, as well as all the Pokemon used for these double battles, and the pre Hall of Fame mods we used in the first video, as well as the updated sets for this video. So you can fully test all the fights, or alternate the sets, tweak things as you will, without having to worry about grinding it or setting it up yourself. And that's that. That's rematching all of Hoenn's hardest battles, the Emerald sequel video. So we're going to transition along here to the outro. Super glad you made it through all the way. If you haven't already, drop a like and subscribe. This video took a lot of work, but I'm super glad to have made it happen. And this video would not have happened without all the outpour of comments and support. So I'm super happy for that. As I mentioned earlier, I will need a slight break before getting onto the Heart Gold Soul Silver Train. But to make up for it, I will be doing some live streaming by myself, and I have some collabs lined up for the rest of the month as well, so stay tuned for that. As always, thank you for watching, see you next time.